please tell people the crazy story about why you have a stormtrooper in your house. <laughs> uh, yes. Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Ilse Samarripa and this is The World Space. Today we have a very special guest joining us. His name is Jean Denis Haas. He is an associate animator supervisor at ILM. He has a very long trajectory working in films like Star Wars, Episode 3 and 9, Solo, Star Wars The Force Unleashed, The Chronicles of Narnia, Pirates of the Caribbean, Transformers, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, Star Trek, Avatar, Iron Man 2, Jungle, Clan Atlas, Star Trek, Noah, A Quiet Place, Avengers, Bumblebee, Aladdin, Mandalorian, and, and many, many others. How are you doing, JD? Thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Ilse, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be interviewed. I'm a big fan of your channel. I like all the, the content and the topics that you have on it. So uh, I say thank you and uh, thanks for interviewing me. The pleasure is ours. Hey, uh, many studios now require artists to work from home. How has your life changed before and after quarantine? Before and after quarantine? Well, yeah, it's definitely been a uh, surprise. I mean, you kind of look at it in the news and how it, it progresses. And for us in California, we have complete lockdown. I think I've been pretty lucky though, because my workshops are online, so I can continue with that. I have my academy classes. I have classes that are in the city in San Francisco, and then I have classes that are online. So the online classes, obviously, they just continue. But the physical classes on site, that was all switched to online now. So it's not, for me, it's okay, because again, I have my setup. But for some of the students, they they depend on the lab for the, the hardware and everything that they need to do the assignments. So the good thing is that, that the Academy is kind of providing a either refund or credit for the next semester. So they're very aware that not everybody can do the work now. And um, my work has, my work where I work, uh, we've had remote working set up for a while now, a couple of years already. So if you're, if my wife is sick or my son is sick, I can go home, help out, log in from home, work, uh, catch up with time in the evening, or if there's overtime and I can't be physically there, I can work. Uh, whenever weekends or evening and do that from home so in terms of what i'm doing everything has already been set up to work from home because i don't commute i see my family more i have more time to be home and i can help out quickly and in that aspect it's actually it hasn't been as bad as you would think but then again my wife she's in a business that's an, an essential business as they say so she has to go out and be trying to you know kind of minimize the risk and wash hands and uh, my older son he also is part of a, a business that is an essential business so it's a bit of a, of a balance and you know we try to be careful and wash our hands and, and limit the the outgoing contact with people and social distancing and um, i think we've been really really lucky uh, but it's definitely not something that we would have expected a couple of weeks ago yeah, we were definitely not expecting coronavirus to hit this hard. It has really affected our industry. Well, leaving that aside for a second, would you tell us a story of how you became an animator? How did I become an animator? Um, well, it's not like I grew up wanting to be an animator all the time. It was more like my dad watched a lot of movies, like a lot of classic movies, Hitchcock and also documentaries and, and James Bond and stuff like that. Animation specifically, but we did go to the movies, see uh, Jungle Book and a lot of Disney influences as well, like Disney on, on TV and everything. And mostly special effects, I think, at the beginning. But because I was from, you know, born in the 70s and then kind of kid of the 80s, uh, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Ghostbusters, Goonies, Back to the Future, all that stuff just had such an influence on me that that's kind of the, the, the things I liked and kind of where I grew gravitated towards I guess but it was never I want to animate we know if you grow up with books you do the whole the flip book thing so I used to do that a lot definitely do little scribbles and scribbles and a little tiny animation of you know people jumping stuff like that I think that was probably the closest I got to thinking about animation until I had to decide what I wanted to do job wise and then actually I chose visual effects so then I went to the Academy in San Francisco and uh, the first semester was visual effects and by first semester I, I say one class because it was very script heavy and math and just how to create that type of of special effect programming and everything and that just was not what i wanted to do i thought it's going to be more hands-on and uh so i switched that major right away and then decided to do animation but i had no idea how it's going to be and then thankfully i liked it and it worked um i mean it worked i'm still working on it but it was something that I definitely enjoyed. And then, so I continued on that path and then graduated and um, and then went through what a lot of people went through with sending out reels, like a lot of reels. Back then it was VHS tapes and uh, got no answers because my reel was not good at all. And then went back and did more clips at home. 
and then went back to the same school for one more semester, reworked my reel and then sent that reel again. It was like, you know, like 50, 60 VHS tapes sending it out to all the companies. And then I got slowly a few interviews and then it was kind of a back and forth of, of uh, like where to go and deciding, do I want to stay in San Francisco? Do I want to go somewhere else? Also, because you don't really have a choice, like you kind of have to go where the job is. Uh, but then at the end, I was kind of lucky and it was a bit of a between Sony and ILM back then. And uh, I chose ILM because I like the city here and I wanted to work on Star Wars. And and uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I got there. And I started there in 2004 in January as an intern. So that was my uh, trajectory from home in Switzerland all the way uh, to here. You were telling me your biggest mentor was Lisa Mullins. How did she impact you? What did you learn from her back in school? Lisa Mullins. Okay, Lisa Mullins, she was the uh, Maya 3 teacher at the academy. So basically what we had back then was kind of like color and design, art history, because I did a bachelor in fine art. So it was, you have all those general classes, you had improv, you had uh, you know all those separate classes, design, drawing, stuff like that. Didn't really learn that much, but it was interesting because I, I had zero experience with that, so it was cool. I kind of wanted to do animation, so I asked the teacher if I could do uh, just something animation related, and he was thankfully okay with that. But again, no explanations, like nothing about what is animation. And then Maya 3 happened, and that was Lisa Mullins. And then she would explain the principles of animation. She would bring up Disney movies, and she would explain why is it like this? What is, you know, a line of action? What's the acting choice there? And she would get up and she would run around the classroom and she would grab people like, act, let's act things out. And she would be really harsh on the critiques in an awesome way. She would say, okay, this is good. This is good. This needs more work. This is not good. You gotta do it like this. And then she would break it down and really explain the reasons behind it, the principles behind it. It was just an, an, an eye-opening class. And to get homework where she would say, okay, here, look at these drawings from the Disney master, study that, here are the movies, watch those movies, watch the idea behind it and the movement, and here's the assignment and do this. To have that as homework, to go and study Disney movies and to have it explained in, in a very fun and motivating way, the way she did it, was just fantastic. And it just, it was kind of like a, oh, this is awesome. This is what I want to do. Very motivational, but also very, I wouldn't say strict, like she wouldn't, she wouldn't just look at an assignment and say, yeah, that's good, A plus. She would go, no, that's a C. In order to get a B or an A, this is what you need to do. And here are the examples, like that's an A and that's a B. And she would just go through the whole material and be really motivating and clear and just very, it's just very fun. It's just a lot of fun to learn from her. Now I have the biggest question for you. How do you manage to spend time with your family and have four different jobs? That is very, very outstanding. Yes, that's a, it's a, it's a juggling for sure. Let's put it this way. I, I shift everything to the morning. So I get up around quarter to five and that's when everybody sleeps. It's quiet. There's no email. There's no text messaging. There's nothing's going on. Everybody's asleep. So that's usually when I go through and answer messages and go through email and the bulk of um, all of the critiques that I need to do, either for classes or workshops or mentor or whatever. I try to do everything in the morning before Wednesday, because for all the classes, usually the deadline is Tuesday midnight. I, it feels like it's like an accomplishment that you got everything done and you can concentrate on the, the actual day job. And if I still have something to do, I can do that in the evening. But I try to squeeze every, everything in into a Monday to Friday schedule. So that Saturday and Sunday is nothing in terms of work or animation. For my workshops, if someone sends me something, let's say Friday evening, and it's kind of late Friday evening, I'm not gonna wait Saturday, Sunday, and then start critiquing Monday morning, because then that person waits. So sometimes you you feel like almost overwhelmed if there's so much to do, and then I just stop. I just do nothing. I know this tonight, I'm gonna do nothing. And watch a movie, or sit somewhere on my couch, or listen to music, or something that I would do already, but just longer, just kind of disconnect from actual work. So I can kind of, recharge and reset, chunk everything into the morning, get all my stuff done, concentrate on the day, work during the day, any leftovers in the evening, and maybe I can work ahead. Like for the channel stuff, I try to do everything early in the week, so then I can just have to, I can just edit and then just publish whenever I need to, uh, and keeping the, the free time and kind of the recharging work-life balance a uh, chunk for the weekend. Yeah, I can imagine. It's very nice that you have actually found that life work balance. What would you recommend someone who wants to settle down but works in this beautiful but very erratic industry? That's a tough question because it kind of depends on 
on your situation or whoever whoever is listening to um i think i would say so i think you will have to look at the cost of living what is more important do you want to work at a company and then structure your life and your kids and school everything around that company or do you want to be in a specific neighborhood that you like like how safe is the neighborhood or does it have a lot of parks where you can play with the kids uh, access to schools and libraries and just is it family oriented and then you find companies around that so you kind of have to look at those two or is it a mix does it work in terms of work-life balance i think that's what i would say is the company cool in terms of the culture and is it going to be okay where you're going to put in a lot of hours and at the same time does it work in terms of it's not too far away and is where you live a good environment for your wife your husband your partner and your kids and just that whole environment and structure, if that makes sense. But it's just something very specific to to you or whoever listens to and the choices that you're gonna have to make. Thank you, that is very useful advice for whenever I decide to start a family. We have another question for you. How many hours a week should an animator who's starting put in their personal work? I know you work very closely with students, so I wanted to ask you that. That's a good question. <sighs> Usually when, when, when students ask me questions like that, my answer is always, it depends and it just drives them up the wall. And in this case, again, it's it's kind of a it depends answer. Um, it depends on how much time does the student have. You want to put in a lot of time just because you need to learn it. You need to, you need to go through all the principles. You need to practice. You can't just do one assignment and move on to the next. So you need to do a couple weight assignments and a couple, at the very beginning, a couple of bouncing balls and bouncing with a pendulum and squash and stretch and with something with a tail and overlap and, and just not go through it once. So a couple weight assignments, a couple walk cycles. But do you have the time? Like, does the student have the time? Maybe you have other classes and then that time gets broken up. So as many hours as you can while remaining sane, where you need that, it, not that it's a work-life balance, but it's a study student life balance, as much time as you can. I guess that would be, uh, that would be my answer. Now tell us, you are a teacher at Animation Mentor. You also give personal feedback at your workshops in Spongella. You teach in the Academy of Art in San Francisco. I will leave all the links for everyone who's interested in the description below. And I wanted to ask you, how has being a teacher changed the way you behave at work? Has it given you different skills or new different approaches for, for leading a team? That's an interesting question. Uh, yes, for sure. And actually, I just talked about that um, to my wife about it. It's when you when you get so many shots from students and because you don't want to waste students time in terms of looking at a shot for half an hour and then, hmm, I don't know what I would tweak here. You start to learn how to identify problem areas of a shot, quote unquote. So maybe there's a general storytelling issue or the timing is just generally off or the mechanics and pops and things. So it's what I've noticed is that seeing all those things and also doing stuff on my channel where I look at movies and kind of analyze them a bit more. Like I don't just watch, I mean, sometimes I watch a movie, I, just, I can just watch them because they're awesome. But every now and then I just can't turn that brain off and I start writing things down. I don't know, I, think, I feel like that's after all this time I don't feel lost when I see a shot. I feel like, okay, this is cool. This needs work. What about this? And I can hopefully bring ideas and and maybe to the students inspiration for their shots. I feel like that's where, where I'm at right now. I'm definitely good at coming up with ideas that are ridiculous in class. That's something I've noticed. So when I see a shot from a student, I, it will be, okay, this is cool. What if? And then I come up with a ridiculous idea and clearly you should never do this, but it kind of leads to other ideas and you can tone them down. And then hopefully that's that's kind of like a springboard for the students. So I feel like that at school and at work. So there's the, it comes back to repetition we talked about before where you have to do an assignment more than once. And I think me critiquing things so many times over and also having similar shots and kind of uh, knowing, oh, I've seen this before, I used to say this, but maybe I can use that with this tweak for this shot. So I think it's the constant exposure and the repetition that has helped me in terms of speed, in terms of giving feedback and finding solutions for potential problems. I think, I hope. I think it's amazing. Uh, I will wrap up this interview by asking you two very, very random questions. I couldn't ask anybody else those questions but you. First, Please tell people the crazy story about why you have a stormtrooper in your house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. I have a Stormtrooper in my house, which is basically a costume that you, know, you can wear. And yes, I have worn the costume. If you're by yourself, it takes about 20 minutes to put on because you gotta put it on with Velcro and put it on. So I got that maybe 25 years ago. As a Star Wars fan, I always wanted a Stormtrooper, either like as a, as a toy or as a statue. And then as you do this kind of research and nerd out online, there was this guy called, I think it was Gerardo Fulano. I think that was it, I can't quite remember. He was in Canada and he had molds of Stormtroopers and he would sell one size fits all Stormtroopers. So you get a costume with no shoes because that would be size dependent. There was some troubles, I think, with him selling because they were too accurate, I think. I think Lucasfilm wasn't happy about this, but I think I just got in before he had to shut it down. I think if he shot it down, I'm just spreading rumors here. But I saw that costume and I, I loved it. And then I ordered it. I have a photo wearing of, of myself. I don't have it here. It's myself. I wear it. My my uh, my older brother is standing and looking like, what is he doing? Although he's a Star Wars fan as well. And then I put that on, and you can see that in, in the footage. And for the longest time, it was the Stormtrooper just standing there, but it had no shoes. So you would have that kind of a translucent, bluish plastic that's the mannequin. So I painted the whole thing white and then the sole and the heel black. And now it looks like it's part of the costume, kind of. But uh, yes, I'm a nerd and I have a costume and it's on display downstairs in the house. And uh, yes. <laughs> Second random question. Please tell our viewers about your chocolate obsession and what is your favorite brand? My chocolate obsession. Well, I'm Swiss. They make good chocolates. Because you asked me beforehand, before we recorded this, I wanted to be prepared. This is... The chocolate brand is Ritter Sports milk chocolate with whole hazelnuts. Um, yes, I like this one. I just I just like chocolate a lot. And the thing is, I would tell my students in the at the academy, I would pretend that if they would give me chocolates, uh, that I would uh, it would be a bribe and it would give them better grades. Which of course I'm not doing. That's unethical and no. <laughs> but it becomes just a wrong long uh, a long running joke, and it's been going on for years. And I think it goes on from class to class. And uh, instead of the students giving the teacher an apple, sometimes they come in and just give me chocolate. And actually it went so far, let me actually, I'm gonna cut that out, but I'm gonna get something. This is something I wanted to post and I haven't, I haven't done it yet, but this is something absolutely fantastic. So this is the original and this, this is what the students did and everything behind it has has a different text. It might be just too overblown, but I'm gonna do a post one of these days and uh, make a photograph with all the details. But not only is it that, because that's the small version for the printout, the actual gift, so this is the small version, <laughs> is that. And everything to the T. It has quotes from the students, even here on all sides. And then the back side has, again, it might just be overblown there, uh, but it's it's so good. The amount of servings, crazy ideas, 12 grams, uh, all my you know nerdiness, love to his students, don't do this, but all the quotes that I have in the in classes, the expiration date, JD's and in workshop. Again, maybe I can tweak the exposure here. Make this a bit darker, and then you can see the craziness. So cool. That was just the best gift I've ever gotten, meaning that I have very, very patient and uh, generous students. The obsession, I just talk about it a lot. And uh, you know, since I'm here, I should open it. This is gonna be very weird and, I, and it's gonna be all this weird eating noise, but it's so yummy. Hazelnut chocolate, milk chocolate. Mmm. Mm. <laughs> that sounds delicious. We are gonna try that one. Thank you so much for being with us here today. I still have chocolate in my mouth. But I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for um, for the interview and the questions were a lot of fun. Thanks for setting this up and I hope it was uh, helpful to anybody who watches that. Thank you. That was Jean Dinichas. If you like this interview, please give it a thumbs up so I know and I can keep making videos like this one. Please leave a comment about what you like, if you have any questions and how can I improve. I would appreciate it so much if you subscribed, that way you'll never miss an interview. And guess what? I am very excited because I pitched Trikingo the idea for a tool and now you can get it. 
It's called A Track and it converts the motion from any object that you have in your viewport to keyframes. It's very convenient for testing, timing, and blocking. You can also learn a lot about the graph editor to understand really how the curves work and playing with the movement of anything. So make sure to check it out. I have a coupon where I get 20% discount in any purchase. This is the coupon I've got in case you're interested. It's IZ20OFF. Trikingo is a site where you can download many different tools and tutorials, so make sure you check them out. Don't forget, act as if what you do makes a difference, because it does. William James. And keep making art, you beautiful artist. Ciao.